So we've got a mix of people that have uh, been using Juju, and maybe you've uh, done some deploys, maybe you've done some <coughs> OpenStack deploys with, uh, with our OpenStack charms. And we've got a few people that are basically brand spanking new. So we're gonna do some high level, uh, high level look at, at Juju to start. And if you've been through this, you're a veteran, I apologize, but we're gonna just take a, uh, take a high level look at that. And then uh, uh, we're gonna also spend some time looking at uh, my colleague here, uh, Liam Young, will be showing us uh, the uh, reactive charm and basically the process that one goes through in developing a charm. Uh, we'll also be able to show you uh, the reactive version of one of the uh, ODL charms, which might be of interest to some of you. Um, and then we can, if, depending on time, we'll talk about uh, some hard learned lessons that, that, that we've learned through uh, uh, guiding other people through their, their charming process. Uh, and, but mostly I want to say that this is interactive. Like there's no interest in me just standing up here talking. If you have a question, interrupt me, throw your hand up, uh, just throw the question out, don't worry about it. Uh, and let's you know, get some conversation going. So uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that this is gonna be a little challenging. I'm gonna be looking back and forth. Uh, I apologize for that. But let's, uh, uh, so basically what uh, Juju is able to do is uh, to uh, model very highly complex systems uh, and then deploy uh, deploy those models into real-world uh, production environments. Um, GGCharms.com is where you can see all of the uh, curated existing charms, uh, including all of the OpenStack charms. Uh, we have, we're trying to build a community where uh, we are gathering the best practices for DevOps solutions uh, of any kind. Uh, but uh, let's say specifically in the OpenStack world, uh, you know, if uh, for people to charm their, their own services uh, and to put into the charms the uh, experience of, of all the ops and developers uh, that are part of the community. And so we want to gather all of that at jujucharms.com. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of fairly large name contributors and participants. Uh, your guys' names will be up here, I'm sure, shortly. <laughs> yeah, so several of them are, sorry. <laughs> And then very quickly, as when, when I say model, um, the OpenStack environment is complex. I think we can agree, right? And the, the thing that Juju does is it takes a service, uh, like let's just say, for example, Glance. And Glance is going to do a, a number of things, right? It's going to have a MySQL uh, connection where it stores its database information. Uh, it might be connected to Ceph. I don't think that's... Uh, represented here, but it could be connected to Ceph to uh, store uh, its image data. It's going to have information that it needs uh, uh, from Keystone to, to make sure that uh, the users who try to access particular images have authentication to do so. And basically what, what we're showing here is that Juju uh, not only shows each service, but it, it gives us a way to interconnect them uh, dynamically so that the uh, uh, the information that Glance needs from each other uh, uh, component of the OpenStack stack, it can gather that information, uh, configure itself, uh, and, then, and then be available. So for one of the things that it does with Keystone is it uh, will publish its own uh, URL uh, for, for images, for the image service. Uh, so again, what Juju does really well is modeling highly complex uh, uh, systems. <laughs> um, Let's see if I can get this up here so I can read this to you. Uh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, what, what, what do you have? So, uh, I guess it, it feels to me that puppet modules and charms are conceptually similar. Um, uh, so yes and no. So we're gonna we're gonna get into a little bit about uh, you know if you have a, a puppet infrastructure, an Ansible infrastructure, a Chef infrastructure already existing. You can actually leverage that uh, with with Juju Charms. What okay. what Juju is adding? In fact, if I go back back a slide here, let's see if I can. Uh, 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 what Juju is adding is the interconnectivity, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you if you're using Puppet, you might have Puppet that uh, can uh, you know represent the configuration file for Glance. But you have to know ahead of time that the Keystone <laughs> service is at a particular IP address and what the username is and the password. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is this is going to do this dynamically. 
Juju deploy Glance, Juju deploy MySQL, Juju deploy Keystone, Juju add relation between Glance and MySQL, Juju add relation between Keystone and Glance, and it has all the information it needs, writes its configuration file, and can be up and running. So if you have Puppet uh, you know, that you, you're already using, your charm could, not in these cases, but if for your service, let's say, you could say, uh, you know, my charm, uh, and in, in the charm code, it could leverage your Puppet infrastructure, either, you know, pulling down, um, <clears throat> you know, a branch or using a, a, a centralized Puppet server and, and execute, uh, you know, the Puppet uh, commands that you would normally do on, on a machine uh, that way, right? So, so in other words, they complement each other, they, they're not... Yeah, yes. So, uh, just, just to... To sure, to absolutely. Expand that. The, the middle net charms do exactly that. Mm -hmm. So they, they leverage the existing investment and they have made in their puppet modules for deployment, put a charm wrap around it for propagating relational configuration data. They still use the same puppet modules they use for any other deployment to actually put configuration down on disk, install packages, whatever it might be. So they complement each other rather than. It, exactly. It, it, that, it, was that, it was that particular thing that the, 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 the nodes and the relationships. Which was the key was a key message in the, the, the presentation that, that Archer and I did at ONS right. about this being an example of a model driven way to deploy an application right. aligned with the concepts of Tosca, for example. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If yeah. not, if not the language, right? Right. Right. In fact, we are language agnostic. So if you want to write in Python, if you want to write in Java, uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of infrastructure for for Python already, but. Uh, um, uh, that, that's up to you. Um, <clears throat> just some high level key points. We want to make, you know, this is all open source. Again, we're trying to build a community. We want uh, participation in the charms. Uh, if you one, want to one comment at the first line, because there's a, a lot of telco guys. Right, so yes. not orchestrate, service orchestrate, right? So. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I see what you're saying. Not, yeah. not in the NSV. It may not, be. Okay, yeah. So we have a language. Yeah, just, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was a VNF manager. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Charm is about one particular VNF. One particular piece, yes, exactly. In, in, in any individual. What is a service? What is a service? So, so again, if we look back at the. Um, the the open stack uh, graphic. Maybe may I can give see a, the, a specific example. Yes. We have a VIMS uh, um, it, VNF that we use in OPNFV for testing. I, that is a service in and of itself. The VNF okay, so VNF. It, it deploys an entire service, yeah. right? But services can be composed of multiple VNFs as well. And in that case, Juju would only work on the, in the individual one and not the overall service, as as I understand it. And maybe that's the detail we take offline, but, but that's, that's an example of what a service means in this context, to me. So, and again, and I, I apologize for not being uh, open VNF specific here, <laughs> but please do jump in to, to correct that. But again, using OpenStack itself as an example, we've got you know, individual charms for each component of, of OpenStack, uh, and, and then how they relate to so each other. At, at the end, is, you know, this is how when you charm your VNF or, or, or your chain of VNFs, so what you can do later on, it's your decision how you map this into charms. So you can decide to uh, encapsulate all services in one charm, or you can decide to model your VNF function into right. multiple charms. Depends what aspect you, you would like to scale or how you would like to play with the deployment architecture. So right. that's an architecture decision how you right. will map this. So I mean, if you have you know a load balancer, right? You got have a load balancer here, and maybe it needs to talk to uh, Neutron Server, which we happen to call Neutron API. Where is that guy? At? Uh, Neutron API um, <clears throat> to get uh, to be able to you know uh, find information out about the available networks. Uh, you would have you know your load balancer charm, and it would relate to Neutron API, just as an example. Does that make sense? Let's see, um, just a couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, that the the idea is that we're we're event based, so we have things like uh, an install hook, we have a config uh, config hook, uh, we have relation hooks. So 
uh, in each of these instances, uh, you're going to have uh, code that reacts to that environment uh, or, or that uh, event. And we're going to talk about a, uh, the reactive framework that makes that a little simpler even than that. One more layer of abstraction that makes that slightly simpler. Scalable, if you need to uh, add um, a new unit to add a, a, a um, you know, up or down, removing a unit, adding a unit is, is as simple as did you add unit or uh, did you destroy a unit. Um, again, what we already discussed, but you know, if you're already using uh, uh, Puppet, Ansible, what have you, we also have mechanisms for using uh, Docker containers. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, best practices for um, integrating um, Chef Ansible uh, into a charm? Is there a yeah, I think we have a uh, print of a charm. Right, I think we have some examples on the Charm store. Yeah. Uh, also, on I'm going to make a, a plug here for on Pound Juju on Freenode. We have just a ton of, of hackers there. Uh, a guy named uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Chuck. What's Chuck's last name? Lazy Power. La yes, Lazy Power is on my desire seeing Nick. I can't think of his last name right now. Uh, but he is the uh, our container god. Uh, he also does a lot of work with Ansible and. Uh, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we have several people uh, that are available that have kind of expertise in that area mm -hmm. that we can we can point you to. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to create uh, like um, non-standard uh, hooks? Non-standard hooks. Uh, so again, we're going to talk about reactive, and you can create you can create what we call a synthetic event. Uh, and so yeah, so you could so in concept yes, you can create your own. Uh, your own event that you can then react to. And do we have a, like a rollback, so if something going, is going wrong inside the execution of the hook? Yes. Can we just roll back what has happened? Roll, rollbacks are slightly tricky, but what, we, what uh, Juju does is it'll let you know that there's been a problem, and then uh, you can actually do a thing called debug hooks, where you can actually jump in uh, into the context and See what see what went wrong. See like you can uh, rerun rerun a hook and see uh, you know what what's failing there. So, um, <clears throat> did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Vertical scaling. Do you have any support for that? For vertical scaling. scaling? Um, uh, let me see. Make, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by that. <laughs> like uh, increasing the capacity of one VM. Of one VM. Uh, so we would probably uh, encourage like. Uh, you know, bringing up a, a, another another node with a, a larger uh, footprint and then destroying the, the the smaller one, right? That's probably the, the direction that we would suggest. Uh, James, do you have any input yeah, on that? Not in place. Yes, yeah, not in place. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's really the core of the question. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> So again, we can. And what's not in here is, is model. We can model, deploy, scale out, uh, integrate complex pieces. Uh, the, this is the key. I think a key differentiator that about Juju that's that's really important, and that is that uh, it's not just OpenStack that Juju that Juju uh, will manage. So with uh, Maz, our Metal as a Service, you can uh, you can Juju deploy onto onto Metal. Uh, we support all the public clouds, uh, you know, AWS, uh, Joynet, uh, Azure, what have you, uh, as well as OpenStack. Uh, and we have the, the uh, ability to work with containers. So, uh, so basically, you're, you can have your development environment uh, locally using LXD, uh, and, and then you can take that same set of Juju, uh, Juju charms and a bundle, we'll describe a bundle in a minute, Bundle just describes a set of charms. Deploy it locally on your laptop, test it out, uh, maybe have a staging environment, let's say on OpenStack, and then you decide, hey, I want to go to the public cloud. You use that same bundle to deploy it on AWS. So again, this idea of this, this model follows you from dev, staging, out to production in whichever uh, cloud environment you're interested in. Um, we're trying to, the problem we're trying to solve is complexity and speed. Um, the, uh, the easy part is creating virtual servers. We've got that covered. Uh, but the difficult part is making everything work together, right? So again, uh, beyond just uh, um, config management is making disparate pieces work together, uh, talk to each other. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, I think we've we've run this into the ground. <laughs> if there's any more questions on uh, Puppet and Jeff or Ansible, uh, again, uh, we'll, uh, we'll point you to some people that have uh, more expertise. So just, just to put out an important detail sure. there, is that because the encapsulation that Charm provides is at the service level, you don't have to make a commitment, but every Charm you write to be in Puppet. You, know, you, you right. can mix and match, you can consume other charms, right. charms that are already written, and you really don't have to care what they're written, because that was that author's choice. All you need to know is how to relate to them, how to present the right data over those relations to get to get them to create a database for you or register a keystone endpoint. That's the, it's the data semantics in the relation that are really to have with it. Right. So as, as you can see there, four different technologies which work fine together. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, and again, if you wrote, if you want to write your charm in Java, it's going to be no problem when you relate to a charm that was written with, with Python, right? It's not going to be a problem. Juju, Juju is in the background taking care of all that information, handling that, the relationships uh, uh, between the two. Okay, uh, this, this slide deck, slightly out of date, but again, I want to point out that what, the, one of the ways that uh, we at Canonical deploy OpenStack is we'll do uh, uh, MOS uh, to deploy on Metal. Uh, OpenStack itself, right? And then we'll have uh, Juju interacting with OpenStack to uh, deploy workloads on top of that. So, uh, so not only we can deploy OpenStack itself, but then once OpenStack is up, we're able to then deploy workloads on onto OpenStack. So we have kind of two layers uh, of, of Juju. Uh, so uh, again, people are uh, you know I don't think people can appreciate it until you you see it, but you know to bring up. Uh, a mass deployed OpenStack in a matter of uh, you know 45 minutes or so is actually a thing to behold. So, uh, so we're able to do that, and then uh, able to then on top of OpenStack also deploy all uh, all number of, of workloads. Yeah. So explain the difference at a high level between what Juju is doing to deploy OpenStack and say Fuel. Uh, the way I understand it is that's a in simplest terms Fuel is a purpose-built tool for that. Mm -hmm. This is a generic tool for that. But Correct. what are the gaps? What's the difference between what the two do? That is a good question. Do you want to, you want to take that one? <laughs> so so yeah. Juju is the deployment tool. The OpenStack charms are the equivalent of Fuel from that perspective. Right. Although there is overlap with Fuel, with Juju, with MADS, with, with various right. other different right. reds of the stack. We've chosen a route that very defined, it's very clear delineation between responsibility. MAS just does bare metal provisioning and management. Juju does the service modeling. The charm encapsulates exactly how to deploy a service and how it relates to other things. So those three things together are providing on par with what fuel is providing for this deployment. I have an opinion. I, I, I think it's good, and I, uh, I, I won't guarantee it. But in, uh, in fuel, <coughs> there's, um, there's an order of execution. And near the after set, standing up the stack, I believe is is when the uh, the plugins execute to to uh, to install additional services like uh, um, other other well, like fuel plugins. You mean? Fuel plugins, like, like right? Contrail or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. And so the difference there is that that's very sequential. It's not based on relationships. It's based on a sequence in time. Uh, whereas Juju is based on relationships and uh, prerequisites. Uh, some services need to be up and running before other services can get started being deployed. Yes, that's, that's true. true. And, and it, <laughs> wait, no. And uh, it's, um, it's worth pointing out that GGMAS is not, it's a deployment tool, but it's a lifecycle management tool. So um, once you're deployed, then the model then has the ability to react to events happening in that. So expansion in capacity, you add capacity to a service, and anything that's related to that service gets notified about it. Right. There's no central control to then go and tweak all the configs to add extra bits of pointers everywhere. That's encapsulated in each charm, and it's part of the life cycle. Charms can also provide ops type functions. Um, we have, in, in place at the moment, we have the ability to do things like in place upgrades of OpenStack, that sort of stuff. We have the ability to pause a unit, take it out of service, put it back in service once you've finished maintenance. That's all provided as part of the encapsulation of what the charm is. So it's, I think that is a little bit more beyond what Fuel is doing. So Fuel's deployment tool, gets your, your cloud down. Juju and the OpenStack charms are a lifecycle management tool for the right. entire life. 
the yeah, they're, they're trying to go that way. I know they're trying to go that way. So, but, but still, where do you, so when you deploy with fuel, you have to give it a bunch of information, config information. Do you do the same thing? Maybe you'll get to this. Do you do the same type of thing here? It's similar. So th this session is very much focused on the, the, the kind of engineering bits of how to write a charm, which is a component of the overall deployment. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys are going to cover bundles. That's, I was just about to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so but bundles are an encapsulation of a deployment. <clears throat> which is multiple services, relations, placement information, that sort of stuff. Um, that's YAML. Um, but then we have our um, two other projects on top of that. Uh, one is Conjure Up, which you may have seen mention of this week. Um, and the other is the um, uh, Landscape Autopilot, which, which, which is providing an orchestration layer on top of this to get okay. down. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not to delay you further, so no what, what, no one, one of the goals of understanding how this works is to say, okay, yeah, just like you said, install OpenStack bare metal or whatever, sure. right? And then install a, a, a service on top of it. Right. So one of the, the, the test cases for how far you can go with this idea, can I install an OpenStack service on top of OpenStack? Okay. Yes. Okay, and, and so I want to figure that out because that's one of the goals I, I have, for example, to demonstrate how you would install a service running in a VM, but also have that service be able to access the APIs of yes. OpenStack. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, this is kind of slightly related, not quite, but we do a lot of our CI testing with uh, nested OpenStack. So we have OpenStack, the thing we call server stack that's on mass physical hardware. And then we do our CI, so we're bringing up stacks virtually. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's Inception, right? It's OpenStack on OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> and they have access uh, to all the APIs on the, uh, on the, the what we call the... the undercloud. The under, yeah, the undercloud. Yeah, right. So you, you, know, you can definitely access that. So what you would do is you'd have configuration that would pass that, 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 that information uh, uh, yeah, to I, it. And I would encourage you to think of it as the workload you're running on the cloud is access to the API rather than you deploying part yeah, of exactly. the control plane of the cloud in the cloud. That, that's, right. a better, <laughs> that's, a better, right. that's a better use case. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were going off on a weird thing. Yes. <laughs> so I don't want to do it. <laughs> Uh, James is the safety control. He just, <laughs> <laughs> when we're just heading over the cliff, he'll stop us. So, so whereas a uh, charm uh, is rep the representation of an entire service, everything it needs to be related to, all the configuration uh, that it needs, a bundle is a set of charms, uh, and it is also uh, will also have uh, the pieces uh, of configuration that are necessary. What I want to point out is that you can. On the Charm Store, we have a number of bundles as well. This happens to be the OpenStack base uh, bundle. Uh, but you can uh, deploy these with either uh, Conjure Up, uh, GG Deploy 2.0, you can just do uh, GG Deploy and the bundle name, and it'll come and grab this and, and, and deploy it for you. Uh, so let's see if I can actually get us to see this, uh, the YAML itself. Uh, just, 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 just on the right. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to ask me for some more Straight down, straight down. One more. One more. Sorry. You can link directly to the app. So. Oh, I got you. Okay. So we have this idea of knowing when we've got enough information to enable the service. So we, we, once we've got all the information we need from each relation, we can render a config file that's, that's got all that in it and have the, or at least have a mutual service. So this, so, quick, 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 quick question. So in, in installing Congress, I install MySQL as part of the server. So you're saying here, I don't have to do that, right? Correct. No, yeah, yeah. you don't do it. You, you will, you, you relate to, you relate to, um, to MySQL. MySQL passes you back a username and password and a database. That would be, can I can pick the username and password, or uh, you, you, because that makes it required. If, if you're writing the charm, you can release the username. So okay. you can pick yeah. username. Okay. Passwords are always good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Username might be important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So with just about any OpenStack charm, you want data. You want information from these services. You want data from a data. You, you want a username and password from a database. You want. Um, similar information from Rabbit, and you want to inter, uh, interact with Keystone in some way. And then you want to write that data and you want to restart the service. So this gets us to the point where we have 24 charms that we, as a team, actively manage. 
and this code is not dissimilar across those genes. So we don't have inheritance. We did have a, um, a sort of central charm library, um, but actually we found the code was overly complex and for people who were starting anew and even for people who weren't. So what we've done is we've got these interfaces and layers. And, then, and when you build, um, and what I'll do now is I will just go um, show you the open V switch slide or oh, does it look so just just to clarify that a little bit, so when you get past a charm that has one relation, we wiki uh, your wiki needs a database, very simple, mm -hmm. not complex at all. Um, so you're responding to one data event which you have got a database connection. Notice that charm, maybe four or five connections. The thing you're interested is in is when all four or five of those things are ready. Then you can start your service and you have something that's operational. So rather than responding on an individual hook basis, you just wait for those states to be set. And this is what Liam will demo now, is, is how you can then say, say, assert when these four things are ready, write my file and start my service. And it makes your charm like three lines of code. So. And, if, and if I could add to that, add to that as well, this is why that's complex and why this, the reactive framework is going to simplify that is, is part of, again, the power of, of Juju in that if you were doing this by hand, you'd have to go you know, set up MySQL, figure out, create a bunch of users, get passwords and usernames, come over here, set up Rabbit, create a bunch of users, create a bunch of usernames, go to your service that you actually care about, right, and put in all those users, uh, uh, the usernames and passwords in your configuration file and, and set that up. And what Juju is doing is, is just doing that all dynamically. It's bringing that all up. And it, you were, we were talking about parallelism earlier. And in parallel, right? All that's happening at the same time. It doesn't have to be that MySQL is deployed first, and then Rabbit, and then my service, right? You just deploy the bundle and walk away. And Juju just handle all, all of this. And part of what we're describing is that the charm it, uh, kind of is aware of, OK, I have three of the four relationships that I have. I'm waiting on that. That, that fourth one. And the reactive framework that this method of, of developing a charm simplifies that process tremendously, and that's why we're working on it. it but in some cases where you don't, you don't have that freedom to be so parallel, right? You can sequence this, right? For example, I, I have to create the database, right. right? I have to then configure the schema for the database, right? right? And only when that's done I, can I create the user and start the service. Well, yes, so in your charm you do that. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, All right. So what you're so what you're describing is like the standard OpenStack API service. Okay. I need I need a message bus information. I need a database information. I need to run a DB sync of some description. Mm -hmm. I need to render some config. I need to restart service. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just so what we've got here is and that will go soon. Um, I've got a very small um, charm, which is much smaller than the last one, and only consists of a few files. So you can see all these are templates. We've got the metadata YAML that we've already discussed. Um, and what I was just showing you there was the layer YAML. And the layer YAML, when I come to build this charm, it says, what do I need? And you, um, what I had was the new charm Um, it, it inherits this OpenStack API layer. And what that does is it says, actually, I need the interfaces rabbit, I need the interfaces, uh, the database interface, I need the Keystone interface. There are some config options which are common across them all, like the, the, uh, whether to use syslog, verbose, debug, OpenStack origin. It's all common. So that's all kept. So these are all kept in, in, in layers that aren't part of this charm. But when I want to assemble this charm to actually deploy it and run it, I run a charm build call. It's like a source package. I run charm build and it assembles the whole thing and I end up with a charm that has all the complexity um, sort of built in, but it's, it's, it's the code that we're now collaborating in one place on. So the other, I just want to show you the So layer is kind of like a, 
another uh, component you can pull in, but it's not about relationship or it's configuring. Right, so just to be clear, uh, interface is how you're going to relate to another charm. And a layer is a common uh, piece of code that multiple charms might need. So if I've got, you know, again with OpenStack, we have uh, you know, a, a number of different charms that, that have some similar functionality. And so we've written the, these three layers that uh, Leon's going to be showing you so that anybody can come along, grab those three layers, and you have all of the code that we've already written for you. You've got that off the bat. And you don't have to deal with that, that those bits, right? And that pan repeats itself, so we've done the same for SDNs and yes. for block storage backends, and you just do need to relate to exactly the same things, irrespective of what the actual underlying implementation is. But I'll shut up and let them go. <laughs> <laughs> so when the, when the charm is first, when, when I've done a Juju deploy, and this charm is coming up on a container, on metal, on a virtual machine, or whatever, the install hook fires, and I'm going to run this, these three lines of code. And what this is doing is configuring um, the source. So this is like saying, if I'm doing uh, uh, Kilo, yeah, I'm trusting, or Taka, I'm trusting, then I need to point at a different package repository. So this, this is going to configure that for me. And then this is going to install any packages that I've uh, that designate needs. Um, and, I, and that's not magic. That's, that's handwritten in another file that I'll show you. And it's going to install those packages um, for designate, and then that that's completed. And then this, as you can see, it's not it's not driven by a hook executing. It's driven by this event, which is saying I have got a relationship with AMQP. I'm connected to it. I don't necessarily have all the information I need. All I know is I do have a relation with it. So I'm going to tell Rabbit that my username is designate and I would like a vhost for an open stack, and then I'm done. Similar um, pattern here, if I've got a database, I need to tell the database my name, and if I, and this is going to prefix the database username and password, and so that I can actually ask for two databases, um, which is increasingly common. Um, so a quick question, on, well, you, you said that the, the dependent packages installation yeah. is something that you have to maintain, right? Yeah. Uh, is, is that something that you know you can you can get from OpenStack or is it something that you have to truly maintain as every release comes in you have to modify the package list? Like well, like for example there's a requirements file for, for, for Python, right? For installing, which makes it really easy. Right, but these are distro packages. It's okay. not it's a different thing. Okay. Um, so yes, if you're gonna distribute using devs via an app repository, yes you need to package each release, but also, you could deploy from source repositories with particular branches. So, it's not a hard and fast rule. Like, a, the okay. installation source should be verifiable. That's kind of a good practice. Like, you know, a known source with a, hopefully with some sort of hash checksum that's known, or a key, even better. Um, but it doesn't have to be packaged. This example is packages. Yes. This so is that one that's coming out of the OpenStack team that come up. So when I was pointing to that bit of install, and this code runs as soon as you install, that you could pip install in a virtual and do whatever you like. It just happens that this particular set of classes is built around um, packaging. Um, so for designate, I need all these. And that's going to result in these services, you know, the ones that are in the initd or systemd services that I can reference. These are the API uh, endpoints that it's going to uh, listen on. And then I've got um, this restart map is actually, uh, we need to tweak this slightly because the reactive framework has grown um, some additional features, so we just need to change this slightly. But basically, what this is saying is if I if the designate.conf file changes, then these are the services that need to uh, change. And the lazy author, me, has said in this particular case, restart everything on everything. But that should be much more granular. Um, this charm's a work in progress. Don't shoot me. So those packages would be installed, for example, using APT, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So if, 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 we, if we don't have some like published stable package, right? That's fine. Then we, we have to use something else like you know, clone a repo and. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You can, you can go right. get, you can do pip, you, you can do either any, one. anything okay. you want that right. your, your network has access to. Okay. So with this reactive framework, if, you don't, if we go back to, um, go back to the handlers, if you don't want to do this, 
If you want to do something else during the install phase, just do it. It doesn't matter. You can do whatever you like. It's, you know, if the reactive framework is not dictating that you install anything here in mm -hmm. this way. All it's doing is providing, um, it's, it's giving the framework so that we can do the layers and provide the events yeah. uh, for so you to You can see here a mix of reactive framework and how we've chosen to model yeah. open stack in Python to make it easy to write minimal code in each channel. So, but I, for your example with where you need to install from source, then I would just override the install method on the class and install from source as that. Yeah, for example, like, like, like the, the you know, OpenStack client, right? Some of them require, some services actually require that be installed. Right. So that would be, in this case, we could just throw that in the list of, of dev packages that can install for that by app. Or any other mechanism that you have for installing that. So, so this is, um, and the author should have called this something better, but um, <laughs> this is the, uh, so this is like, I've got everything. I am, I'm, I'm ready. So I've got, I've got a DNS backend that's available. So this is the designate channel, channel, so it needs somewhere to store um, the DNS records. It's got its shared DB relation. It's got its a relation with Keystone. It's got AMQP as well. So and it, it's got those relations, and it's got all the data that it thinks it should have from those places, and it's ready. So um, designate's a funny one in that you have to you have to render the config, then create an object inside designate, write it back to the config and restart it. Um, so that's actually what this is doing. So I write my initial config, I do the database sync, um, you know, like your neutron db manage, whatever, or in this case designate something. Um, I create the domains that I need, and then I render the uh, and then I render the config with that domain in and restart the services. So uh, this isn't the entirety of the charm, because obviously I've had to write the code that does these things. Um, but what it, I think I hope it shows is that you're getting the events back from each of the um, services that you can then consume. Because this is I read the config based on relation based on the data um, from the other services and restart is just it's everything. You know, it's what all the services do. So um, yeah, it's a comment. I, I don't want to take this off topic, but uh, when we're installing packages and stuff and, and doing, uh, some of those things can be OS um, uh, specific. Uh, so OS agnostic type stuff is... Y your term would have to be intelligent to recognize recognize which OS you're on, right? So, right. so again, the hard work is in the term development. We're, you know, right. I, I don't want to. <laughs> so you know, the, there can be really poorly written charms that don't handle all eventualities <laughs> that, yeah. that are going to fall on their face, right? But if you're planning on deploying on multiple different uh, environments, you have to be uh, you have to be aware aware of that. Is there anything um, like that uh, do terms uh, the, the, the infrastructure with the the environment? Does it provide anything like that at all, or is it just? I'm sorry. Does it, what does, does it provide? Does it provide any like uh, libraries or anything to to help with that problem? Or so we can try to change the thing. Yeah, so, I think James uh, is dying back there. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> relatively new. Um, so uh, there's there's a common library used across most charms called Charm Hoppers, um, which is aggregation of like. Python libraries that help you do various things when you're writing charms, um, like install packages, for example. Uh, we just had an external contribution from the guys at Cloudbase who do stuff across CentOS and Ubuntu and, and Hyper-V uh, to add um, uh, CentOS support for charm helpers for installing packages, for example. So your charm still needs to differentiate between if I'm on Ubuntu, I want these packages, and if I'm on CentOS, I want these packages, but there's there's uh, a live, there will be a library there to, to help you then complete that installation because only the charm knows what it needs to install on each of those two things, but how it, that then gets installed is, is fairly generic across the board. So, 
And, and to be clear, you know, we have people that are writing charms on Windows. So I mean, we, you can have that dramatic of a, of a difference as long yeah. as that charm is intelligent enough to recognize. Are we doing open stack? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Not that I want to plug my own tool. <laughs> So I just wanted to see, so that designate charm, that skinny charm that didn't have much code in it, and I just wanted to show you that you then do this charm build, and the charm tools will go along, look at that layer's got and they'll start to pull in. You can see it here pulling in um, into places. Um, the other thing that's worth saying is that our charms are um, the, um, the development process for our charms is the same as for other open source projects. So if I look at my watch changes, I've got, it's the same, you can recognize the charm names here and you know, it's the same process. So if you're used to contributing to OpenStack, other OpenStack projects, then please <laughs> contribute to us too. So yeah, using Git review and the, you know, the exact same process if you were contributing uh, mm -hmm. to upstream. If, yeah. if when you're starting your charm, you want to put it under the OpenStack project, alongside the rest of the charms, that's entirely possible, and we can help guide you through the infrastructure of the config changes needed to do Yeah, that. I definitely yeah. tend to do that with coders. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't overly onerous, just we had to pick our timing, so we went mm -hmm. right in flight with the release. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything else you think? So just, just on the charm builder, it's worth picking out that although the designate charm is, 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 is including the OpenStack API layer, you can then see that that's picking up our principal layer, which is then picking up an OpenStack base layer, which is then picking up the basic layer. Yeah. Reactive is actually injected in, in the basic layer. That's the reactive base layer that any reactive charm will inherit. So um, if you're not writing an OpenStack service, which I'm guessing the number of you probably won't be, um, the layer basic is a great place to start because it gives you all the base reactive framework to start authoring this stuff. Okay, so um, your install may look very different to an OpenStack component. It may be a tarball you're extracting, it may be a from source install. Um, all you need to do is, is think about the events that you need to respond on on, on relations, um, things you need to be related to, um, how you're going to install. Um, the, the model we're using in the Desmond Charm is slightly old. We've actually moved to a uh, model where we actually have a state called installed, and when you're, that state is not set, you run install. So it, it's just a slightly different model for hooks. Actually, install is not guaranteed to fire first anymore. Which is <laughs> I'm not going to get into the details. But there's, there, there's some, some neat examples. Um, we can also point at other a number of reactive charms which are, are taking slightly different approaches, but still using the same underlying framework. Um, have we got the Open Visa Trail DL charm? Uh, yeah, that would be really yes. helpful because it's not OpenStack. It's right. OpenV switch plugins already out, so okay. it's, 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 it's a little bit different from a flavor perspective. So, a question about the environment that you're, you're op actually operating in right here when, when you started the, the build and it went and did these things, right? Yeah. Are, are, are you running like DevStack? Are you running a multi node cluster with OpenStack? Or what, what's your environment here? So to build the charm, it's just on I, I just have a trusted laptop. So that's all I need to build the charm. To do the deployment, to deploy the charm, um, I would need something. Because you were you were you were switching to LXEs there, etc. You know, the yeah, well, machines, right? So, so, so this, this are you one, doing this entirely on your laptop or? No, no. So you mean you mean this this environment here? So this is a ah, um, yeah. So th th I wish the screen was running, but uh, so this is actually a running. Um, OpenStack on top of OpenStack, and you can see each of the charms, um, and you can see it's telling you that the unit unit is ready. Not in your laptop, though. Not on my laptop. This is in some server out in data center. Or so we we have an OpenStack uh, stack that we call server stack that's in London, and okay. we have access to that. And what he's done here is okay nested another OpenStack deployment on okay. on that server stack. So just to kind of, to kind of replicate the, the, the experience of going through this very simple charm here, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, in, in kind of a, you know, uh, sort of a learning VM case on a laptop yeah. or whatever, right? right. It, it'd be good to know what kind of dependencies and how you set it up. Okay. Okay. So, so um, this, this is our particular QA environment that we've had in place, mm -hmm. which is actually where all of our gating happens for our charm work. So um, it requires a scale because we have to deal with a number of changes being raised all the time. We found a cloud is a very good place to do that. 
we've done quite a lot of work in the last six months to allow you to do the same thing with your laptop because we recognised that the, the level of entry for having a cloud to do this shit on was, was um, hard. <laughs> you know, not everybody starts off at that point in time. So um, it is it is possible to now deploy an entire OpenStack cloud on your laptop using containers. It's still multi-unit. You still get all the same modeling semantics of relations and charms and IP addresses and all that sort of good stuff just running on your laptop. You're going to need an SSD, it's the only thing I'd say, but most people have that. Yeah, it's a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday, 11.30. I'm <laughs> no, but absolutely, that, that's really important. So like, you know, like go see James's uh, presentation, that will explain how, how to get this running up and running on your laptop. And that will speed up the development cycle tremendously. So this is the um, Open B Switch. This is the, yes, it is the Open B Switch ODL um, child, which you plug into, which you plug, plug into a Nova computer. Um, so again, this should look familiar. When when we're told to install, we install, and there's a similar class that has that list of packages in it, which is what's going to get installed at this point. It's a uh, it's a subordinate, so it can't control where its packages are coming from. Um, so this is, I've got a relation uh, with an ODL controller, um, so when that relation is complete, um, I can configure uh, Open B switch and we can dig down in a minute and see what that means if you like. Um, when this, when I lose my relationship, yes, look, when not, when I lose my relationship with OBSDB manager, unconfigure Open B switch. Um, and then this status set here is for the operator. Well, when they do juju status, they can see this message. So they know why the service is gone, why there's a problem with the service. Um, and that's what you would see in the juju status command. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So one thing, as a, as a, if I can jump in, as a chart developer, is you want to communicate to the end user as much as possible. And, and setting a status that is viewable by the user is extremely helpful. So you can say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm waiting for this relationship or I'm, I'm waiting for this piece of information. And, and that's an example of that. Yeah, exactly. And you, and you can see that here. If, if I deploy this job that I neglect to uh, uh, relate it to the OBSDB manager, this is, what, this is what the user will see blocked. I can't do anything. I don't know where o, um, ODL is. Um, or when everything's good, open be switch configured and ready. Yeah, um, this is the example that I was mentioning before, where this is a subordinate chart, so this gets deployed on the same node as Nova Compute, um, but uh, it, re it requires that Nova Compute have some uh, have particular settings inside it, um, and it's Nova Comp. So, yeah, so this is going to stick in. So it's going to set the firewall driver, the fifth driver, and um, the security group API. And then we. What else we got? Well, okay, so with ODL, you need to register the node that you're running on, and you would need to register the MAC addresses on uh, the interfaces on that node. So if I've got uh, access to the controller API, then I can do both those things. So the author of this has chosen not to bundle these two together. Um, so you've got two different methods you're um, reacting to the same event, which is fine as well. Um, and I'll just let's see if I can dig down into what's actually happening in the some of those events. So, I wish you'd pull it out. So it's part of the thing. He's been hiding back there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this, again, when we say uninstall packages, that's what we're doing, purging them. And then you might recognize some of these commands. And it's when we want to configure the remote manager. Configure open the big switch. So it's just a slightly different flavor of charm in that open the big switch configuration does not involve writing configuration past the disk. It involves interacting with the daemon to set particular yeah. So um, the, the same framework can be used just to a different effect. So depending on what you're trying to deploy, 
can probably model it somehow in Python. So there's, there's great flexibility. Yeah. Just a quick word about, uh, we've been using the term subordinate term, uh, just to clarify that, uh, between a, a subordinate and a principal. Uh, so if I use Nova Compute as an example, Nova Compute is the principal term, it actually gets a full instance, it gets a full machine for our laws, or it gets a full VM uh, <clears throat> if we're in virtualized. And, uh, but we want to relate uh, Open vSwitch ODL so that a Nova Compute is using uh, that, that as an SDN. So uh, we, Open vSwitch ODL is not going to be principal, it's not going to get its own VM, it's going to live right next to, it's going to live on the same VM that, or the same machine as Nova Compute and interact with Nova Compute. And so, so, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so this is a deployment that's not using ODL. Um, and what we've done, and what, and so you can see in this deployment, where you would see Open okay. vSwitch ODL, if you use an ODL deployment, and you've actually got neutral Open vSwitch uh, channel. And it's a subordinate, you see it's slightly indented. <laughs> but it's uh, IP address, is the same. Right. So it's on the, on the same unit. Yeah. Yeah, so that unit has to be up before that one can then be installed, right? It's a relationship. It's actually that these two are related. Okay. This one comes up, and then that one gets installed. So yes, and on the same host. host. Yes, on the same host. Yeah. So. And, and so another example of this. So if you have a hundred Nova compute units, mm -hmm. it's automatically going to do a hundred uh, Open vSwitch ODL uh, support nets mm -hmm. on each of them. Well, that. One on each. That works also where the service is installed in LXC. You can have a subordinate. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Within the LXC container. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we, we take a similar model to the sender backends, for example. The sender runs in a container. Mm -hmm. The sender Ceph backend provides configuration out to a Ceph cluster. It's all in a container. So the, but the, the important thing is that's a container scope relation. So it's between the principal and its subordinate unit only. There's no visibility of every other unit. There's also a subordinate to the same principal. There's only that one high, one level of hierarchy, right? Principle. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. No. Yeah. <laughs> so not, it's not turtles all the way down. <laughs> yeah, so some, some of these uh, uh, terms, they, like, they, they realize a service on a particular IP, and then you're subordinates on that same IP. Um, so we've got it's a on, T, sorry? Because it's on the same Because it's on the same yeah, host. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we, you know, we've got TCP ports there. Are there handlers for making sure you're not overlapping? No, no. You, you, you have to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, um, Juju in some ways, um, like, you can, what I was going to say uh, was you can use Juju to place new containers wherever you like. So, say this was a running cloud and you were getting particular, and uh, these are your physical machines here, 0 to 8, and you want a new neutron API server or a neutron server. Um, because it's getting stressed, but no date is not particularly busy. You could do juju deploy minus minus two LXC colon eight neutron API, and it will fire up a new LXC container. They'll fire up a new LXC container for you on here, install the neutron server, and and it's done. So um, the server stack that we use, uh, we use this extensively. So we have um, our control plane, and this is James's. Um, sort of topic, but you, our control plane is spread across our compute nodes. So we have sort of five compute nodes, and each one has got multiple uh, legacy containers on. So it gives us some some nice density in there as well. But we can also move things around, delete containers, add new ones wherever on the physical machines to distribute the load. When I uh, wanted to create um, a charm for a additional software like an um, own monitoring agent or something else, and uh, deploy it to all OpenStack nodes um, in parallel. Uh, I create a subordinary. Uh, do I also have uh, to change uh, the charms of uh, the? Uh, it, it depends on whether that charm needs information from the. Uh, the so we have an NTP charm. Yeah. Uh, do we have an NTP? Yes, we do. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> we have some charms that don't need a interface because yeah. they're they're doing. They're just yeah, like okay. just be clear, NTP is one of those in that it doesn't care what it's running on, it's just syncing time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I misunderstood. 
Oh, look, it's great. Yeah. So yeah. NTP is great. Uh, uh, you have to create the relation <laughs> yes. uh, or design <laughs> at the same host? Or yes, it, 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 it uses a, a, so with the NTP example, it uses a built-in relation called GG info. Uh, and so basically that just says, I'm a subordinate, I want to land on, on this unit. And so and you're not, okay. you're, you but don't the, even have to write anything to handle yeah, that. The principal so. has no NTP reaction. It doesn't know anything yeah. about okay. it. It just. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to just quickly show you, just to try and put some. So what I've done here is I've hopped onto a neutral API um, unit and I've changed the configuration. But before I did it, I, I um, started a debug session. So which means I'm caught in the hook. I am now in the context of the code that you write. So the, the code that you write would run in. So what the, what's going to happen is if I, wasn't, if I wasn't in this debug hook session, GG would run this config change tool for me um, and, and exit depending on the um, return code. But, it's, but if you've got a problem, you can jump in and you can run the same thing that is going to run to um, to debug any issues, but this will also show you that. Um, hold on. I'm just going to accept that. Um, <coughs> but if you were doing the most basic charm and you wanted to write it in Bash, for example, you could run scripts like config get, and that would give you all the config that the uh, user set for this particular charm, and you, um, if we do a relation IDs on identity service, we should get the name of the relation that we have with Keystone. So then we can say, okay, um, tell me about the units that make up that Keystone <coughs> service. Come on. And we've only got one Keystone, so it's just key, there's that one unit. And then I can say, all right, tell me the relation data that that Keystone service has sent to me. I've got that long handle. Uh, what should the identity service? Uh, yeah, that's right. All the lamps. So this, this is actually what we were talking about before. This is the bit where I say to Keystone, I want to register an endpoint, and this is the data that um, Key, uh, the key state has sent back to me. It's created, um, it said, here's the service username to use, which is Neutron, here's the password to use for it, here's my IP address. Um, so this might be the BIP if I'd have set up a HA cluster. So I'd, I'd ignore the private address because I don't care what that particular unit's address is, but I do care um, about the BIP because that's what I want to talk to over, and obviously the ports and so on. So this is what's happening behind the scenes. This is the data that's being passed around. And I could run that same command to get back what uh, the database had sent to me or um, what Rabbit had sent to me as well. And if I hopped onto the uh, Keystone unit, I could do the reverse. I could say, what did Neutron send to me? You can actually do that there. Can well, you? Like reversing. Oh, no, you're right. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> For did you run, you can. But no. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> So I feel like we're we've completely overrun <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah. I think we have we've got plenty more material. So, but I want to be cognizant of uh, how much information a human being can consume at one time. Uh, I think uh, at this point we might want to uh, break out. We've uh, talked to Brian earlier about a charm that he wants to do for Congress. We've got kind of a wireframe setup for that that we could go through the process of, you know starting to build that charm. Uh, uh, but I want to make, make it available to you to, to, to you know, say I'm out and, <laughs> and bail at this point. So, uh, but before I do that, are there, any, are there any questions? Any other questions that have come up in the process of uh, watching all this? Maybe, maybe uh, where, where could people go uh, from this point, from, you know, if you're a beginner? Yeah. Uh, where would you go next to learn more? Okay, yeah, so for, uh, first place is jujucharms.com uh, slash docs. Uh, there's a, a developer's guide. And actually, if you look at, there's, ver there's a version up on the left-hand side, let's say 1.25, and develop. You actually want to look at the develop version. It's got more up-to-date information about Reactive. 
Uh, it's got, so it's got a developer guide and it'll walk you through the process of building a reactive charm. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, Pound Juju on uh, Freenode. Uh, all of us are there and available. Uh, so you can jump in there and just start asking questions and somebody's, somebody's gonna get back to you. Um, uh, in fact, ask us and we'll give you our, our NICs and you can ping us directly and, and get information from there. Uh, so, so a lot of YouTube videos also, the Charm School uh, yeah. have, you have a whole set of videos from beginner to a specific scenarios to specific models. Um, so that's the next step. And then also, you know, IRC hashtag, all of us are in there. Um, reach yeah. out to me if you guys need, you know, a follow up. Juju mailing list. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So definitely. Uh, and yes. I, I don't know, do you guys know about the oil integration environment? So if you have, if you need resources going through the oil, there's a whole process end to end where um, you have a set of uh, engineers that could walk you through or help you develop with the charms. Also these folks over here will also be involved with that engagement. So that's another uh, channel uh, to get into charming and integration with, you know, Juju and charms. Uh, what is the road ahead for Juju and uh, the development? Uh, what are the next steps? New features to integrate? Or what are you working on? You just released. Yeah, let me, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let me briefly mention uh, a few things. So, Juju 2.0 uh, is is a, a fairly big overhaul, uh, and we've added a few a few things that could be very pertinent to you guys. So, uh, the two that are most important, I think, are, are resources and. Um, I'm blanking, sorry, what's that? What's Network that? spaces. Yeah, well, yeah, we're going to get to that, but uh, um, payloads, payloads. So uh, <clears throat> if you have a, a container, like a Docker container, uh, you can use GGU payloads to manage the, the container's lifecycle. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so you can uh, deploy that with, 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 uh, with Juju, and, and you actually get like a little uh, output of, of the status of, of uh, that container. Uh, resources is uh, a, a way to have any kind of blob. So if you've got a, a tarball that you want to make accessible to your deployment environment that's not publicly available, you can push up that uh, any blob that you need into as a Juju resource. Um, the really kind of exciting thing is uh, with combination with uh, newer versions of Moz, uh, we have uh, network spaces. So you can specify, so if you have a physical host or, or not physical, a host that has multiple uh, network interfaces, you can say, I want my relationship to Ceph to send data over this interface, and I want, uh, I want API communication to go over this interface. So you can, you can segregate out uh, traffic. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's currently only in, in Moz, unfortunately, so in the Moz environment. So um, let's see, what else? Where, where am I missing that's new in Juju Tomorrow? Um, uh, well, that's in, in our charms, yeah. Uh, but also, um, it's the uh, Lexi local provider support. Okay, so that's a good one. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. OpenStack on your laptop, you want to be using that. So it leaves all the utils in 1604. Mm -hmm. So Lexi for container management, uh, ZFS for fast storage snapshot. And the one I was blanking on there is uh, multi tenancy. So we can now, with the 1.x versions, you would do Juju Bootstrap, you'd have a single bootstrap, and you either had the access to the SSH access to that or, or not, uh, basically. Uh, so it's basically one user. Uh, with 2.0, you can create multiple different users. And one other cool thing is that you, you uh, bootstrap a controller, and a controller can control multiple models. So you could have you know, a model environment of, of you know, one environment, and then Juju switch, and you're on the same controller, but have a completely different model that you're deploying. So that's that's a pretty neat feature. So and then you, again, you can create users so that uh, you can hand off to you know say a junior developer or something that, that they can have access to the model that you've deployed. So I, mean, I could deploy ODL and ODL one with this model, and then switch over and have a different one here. Or I could be developing a charm and a separate one again. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Has any upgrade possible from the one? <laughs> uh, you, uh, don't ask that question. <laughs> I think currently that uh, you know the, they, they, that's on the roadmap. They want to have they want to have that, but I don't think it's currently possible. So yeah. So, 
currently targeted to the 2 1 release, which is the best point release after 2 0. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Is uh, network namespaces on um, a feature for 2.1? It's in 2 0. Two, it's in two, 2 0. Yeah, it's already there. Yeah. So. Yeah. 2 0 is out or <coughs> not out? It is out. Yes. yes. Yeah. It was released last week. It's final beta. It's not final yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, stand, I stand corrected. It's pretty really close, but yes. um, it's the, the, the sort of fun with a sweep up to do. Does Zeno have, have it has the latest right? beacon? It has the latest yes. yeah. 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 Just to make sure I understand the network spaces thing. So, so Narendra helped us with this creating the the uh, the basically the Juju support for OPN feet, right? And and in there you have you know what four different networks, right? Okay. It, it, and did, did you do something special to make sure that certain types of traffic go over certain interfaces? Yeah, so we, we changed the data network config in each charms okay. so that I can connect to the data network. So you, you leveraged the feature we implemented before Juju Network Spaces came along to allow you to do this network set up. Okay. Yeah. So you'll find in all of the OpenStack charms as configuration options to do that network segregation. Is still supported at the moment. We haven't taken them away because this is okay. version one of network spaces. Um, that network modeling was never in the Juju model for the, the version you were using. Um, okay. Network spaces obviously is in the Juju model, so you've got okay. compute resources, you've got placement, you've got networking all as a primary concept in the Juju model, mm -hmm. which means there's more direct control over it from Juju. It's much, it's much easier to manage because Juju is managing that complexity rather than just having to reinvent the wheel and the charm every time you want to bind to a particular network segment. So um, what you're currently doing in config, Juju 2.0, you should absolutely be able to do network spaces. Otherwise, file bugs and shouts and <laughs> <laughs> So it should get simpler, basically. It should be much simpler, yeah. yeah. Basically, okay. when you define the charm, um, you specify a bind command line mm -hmm. argument, or there's like a bundle syntax for it. Um, and the charms have, um, in the metadata, um, binding points for API, public, and admin, um, data network, and stuff like that. So the, the same concepts we have in config, but as a metadata concept in, in each charm. And they're there as of last Thursday's release of charms. So. And those are just just tags. I mean, you could add additional tags, right? Or um, So the, the charms only, only support binding for the things they know can be bound. Um, but the, the underlying network space configuration is very flexible. So a network space can, can okay. Consist of multiple subnets across different availability zones, and then depending on where a unit gets deployed, depends which subnet it gets bound to Ooh. for the particular space binding that's been specified. Okay. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So hopefully this uh, helps everybody um, move forward. So uh, the other thing uh, for next steps is go to uh, Mr. Page's. Uh, um, Presentation this week, the Thursday. <laughs> run OpenStack on a laptop. What's it called? Yeah. Uh, it's called multi unit cloud deployment using Next on Next on your laptop. 11.50 wow. on Thursday. Yeah, I didn't think I'd had enough. Yeah, multi unit. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be video, right? We can it's see. in the main summit, so yeah. 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 So so you're not here, you catch that. Um, for reference, what are the hardware requirements for that? You mentioned you would need quite a bit of RAM and an so, SSD. So I run it on my XT40. It's an i5, 16 gig of RAM, and I've got a I've got a 500 gig SSD, which is complete overkill. Like to run a whole stack, it's about 40 gig of spare SSD storage. Ooh. Recommended split into two partitions, so you can have XT40 root and a ZFS pool on the secondary partition for the XT. And it's Ubuntu, of course. Ubuntu 16.04 as well. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it on 14.04, it's a bit more hardware, but you have to do more magic dances because it was a 16.04. Well, we got to move to 16.04 anyway. Uh, right? Uh, so we've been talking. I don't see it here. Yeah, I just looked it up. It's 11.50. Well, 11.50. Yeah. Right. Is that that dependency? Is that uh, DPDK? For the Xenio, no, it's not the PDK tied. Uh, basically, the Xenio kernel and the Xenio XD and all the stack around it does everything where it's needed. And ZFS is a Xenio feature, not a 14.04 feature. So it's new for Xenio. So you can do it on 14.04, but it's the KMS value. So you can do it. Okay. The menu stream.
All right, that concludes uh, the boot camp. Hopefully it didn't overwhelm anybody. Uh, these guys didn't overwhelm you guys. Uh, so any follow-ups, uh, you're welcome to stay here. Welcome to reach out to, talk to one of us. Um, and we'll be at the event. Thank so you very much. You see us in the corner. Thank you. Thank you.